Good morning and welcome to Something to Talk About from the Bainbridge Island Senior Community Center, sponsored by Fieldstone Memory Care, Bainbridge Island. Innovative and compassionate care worth the wait. Call 360-271-2530 to schedule a tour of Fieldstone's beautifully appointed apartments right here on Bainbridge Island at Rolling Bay. So anyhow, today I am always thrilled and honored to be able to introduce to you uh, wonderful David Harrison. And uh, David, take it away. What do you have on the agenda? So folks, as you know, those of us who have been, I think all of you have been with us before, uh, we uh, will stop uh, at least twice in the material I put out there so that we can make sure that we're all on the same page. So Today, I want to first talk about uh, whether we're in the midst of a constitutional crisis or not. There was a very compelling op-ed in Washington Post that got thousands of people convinced that we're no longer trying to avert a constitutional crisis, that we're in one, and I want to speak to that, that issue. Uh, secondly, and for the bulk of the time, we need to talk about what's happening in Congress this very minute, that is, as you know, there's drama among, almost all, entirely among Democrats. <laughs> For a long time, we were living for this day that we could fight among, our, among ourselves rather than just listen to what Mitch McConnell's going to do to us. So it's not all bad. And I'm gonna say why I, how I think it's gonna be resolved in the next week. So. Uh, we'll spend most of our time on that. And then I want to end with what's happening in Virginia. As many of you know, we have a full-scale election there of the governor and the full control of the state legislature uh, next month. So we, we would be bereft in our collective duties if we were to close without figuring out what's happening there. So thank you for joining me. First, I want, so uh, this has to do the first, uh, this would just take a minute, but I want to to say what the argument is uh, for let's recognize that we're not trying to avoid a huge constitutional crisis that could spell ultimately the end of our democracy and our noble experiment that started in 1789, but does spell, or at least the, the uh, threat to us is overwhelming. That was a, 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 an op-ed in the Washington Post uh, by a lawyer named Kagan, who was not Elena Kagan's cousin. And um, the argument goes like this, which I think is baloney, I'll say in advance. The argument goes like this, Look at what Donald Trump wanted to have happen January 6th, and how could that not be an attempted coup? Uh, uh, the, uh, the rest of the argument goes, and subsequently, though we narrowly avoided a coup that, in part, Mike Pence uh, prevented by refusing to uh, to discount the electors from various states, which Trump pleaded with him to do, uh, the evidence that we're in the middle of a, of a constitutional decline and that could spell the end of the republic for which we stand is uh, the number of Trump judges, the fact, according to Kagan, that Trump is ascending rather than descending, the uh, efforts, in, especially in Arizona, Texas, uh, Georgia, to discount past results and to change election law uh, to give more power to uh, Republican elected officials to oversee elections, uh, a nation on edge uh, with each other, a, a polarized nation on edge, and the considerable uh, resistance to COVID. So uh, Kagan wraps these what these folks up in a one old big wraps these ideas up in one old big pile of 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 odiferous events, and I think uh, he's forgetting a few things. Monumentally, 
January 6th was not a story of the nation failing. It was a story of the nation holding. It wasn't ever just about Brian Krantz did do the right thing. And he was subjected to considerable pressure to do the wrong thing. But there was no constitutional basis for what Michael, Mike Pence was being asked to do. Further, he wasn't the only one who was on alert. Among other people on alert, actually, were Senate Republican leadership who, uh, who were not going to allow for the overthrow of the government of the United States, not McConnell, not Lindsey Graham, certainly not Mitt Romney. And we get so despairing of what jerks these folks are, we forget that they actually uh, remember that they swore to an oath, oath of office and they were very worried from December 1st that Trump, Donald Trump was gonna try something on January 6th. They gave him a long leash uh, ill-advisedly because they wanted him to help them win the two seats in Georgia on January 5th. So they let him say pretty much he wanted all that time and, and didn't declare the election over because they so much wanted to have uh, um, 50, at least 50 votes in the Senate, and they needed uh, Leffler and um, uh, Purdue to win. And of course, they, they defeated themselves because they let Trump talk and he helped us win in Georgia. And we got 50 votes. And all these, a lot of these wonderful things that happened since, we would not have gotten if we had had 49. But anyway, to make a long story short, the country worked on January 6th. It's easy to be dispirited by the insurrection and so forth. But in the end, uh, Trump failed and it wasn't just Mike Pence that made it so. Kagan argues that all the uh, uh, judges that Trump appointed will fundamentally change uh, the country. Uh, no, they certainly will on individual issues, but if anything, their, their common characteristic is strict construction. They're, they're not inclined to make a, a court that swoops on in on congressional action. So if we want to keep the Trump judges from being uh, hurtful on every day of the year, then we need to keep control of both the Senate and the House. There's an argument that Trump is ascending. The polls don't show that at all. The polls show <laughs> DeSantis, of all people, getting traction. Uh, uh, the, the killer of Florida getting traction on the, on the potential uh, candidates for 2024. Donald Trump's going to be 78. Donald Trump did not want to be president in the first place. Donald Trump is acting like he's running because that's how he raises money and maintains power. There's a lot of concern about election fraud and it's uh, and about creating continually contested elections. Remember that, that uh, there is an election system that's holding uh, strong. And remember that for all that we say about the modifications in Georgia, Florida, Texas, a couple other states, they're really quite small in, terms of what we gained in election accessibility two years ago due to the COVID. So we had maybe 30 million more people able to vote by mail because of, of uh, a change regulations due to COVID. And for the most part, we have held on to those regulations. So it is vexing that in uh, Texas and Florida and Arizona, their full intent is to discourage African Americans and Latinos from uh, uh, um, from voting, and that's reprehensible. But its scale is tiny, and it's happening in states where uh, that that uh, may not carry the day in the first place. Even in Georgia, where where they're doing silly things. 95% of Georgians are already registered because of Stacey Abrams. So it is true they're taking away uh, the 
ability to vote Sunday afternoon after church. And they're doing that because they're jerks and anti-constitutionalists. But uh, let's not overstate that the, the damage they've done. With regard to COVID resistance, the majority position is not only for uh, vaccines, but for vaccine mandates. Uh, as COVID recedes, if we can only get it to recede, uh, that's going to be a major Biden advantage and a major disadvantage for the DeSantis of the world, because one will be able to prove through scientific research the extra amount of people who died in Florida because Sanus is a jerk. And uh, don't think that that won't be a part of the election for governor in Florida next year when either the agricultural commissioner or Charlie Crist will run against DeSantis. This will come up. Floridians uh, know that they're taking on extra mis misery and it gives us uh, a good shot at the future. So that's the end of my initial uh, disquisition on why we should be worried about the threats our democracy and our country faces, but should not buy into this uh, Karen and I were both on a, a Facebook exchange where people are talking about the level of fear, disgust, misery, and apprehension that we should feel. And I'm not taking away any of that. I'm just saying we did not have a coup on January 6th. The fact that a malevolent, dysfunctional, neurotic, psychotic uh, person sought one does might want to make us feel good that so many people uh, wouldn't play along. And the idea that this is an inevitable of 2024 uh, when we control the House and the Senate, the presidency is silly. So I'll stop there and take insights, insults, thoughts, concerns, and then I want to get on to what's happening today. Um, I, I just want to let you know, I know several people live in Florida and they love Charlie Crist. Um, They've lo loved him forever. So do you think he has a pretty good chance? Well, the agricultural commissioner, who's the primary opponent of woman, is, is strong too. So I think uh, uh, DeSantis's polls are dropping significantly, but they are fluctuating. In the you know, it, it helps his base, him with his base, when we attack him. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, you know, that's uh, the average age in Florida is older and there's a lot of people who feel that he messed up COVID from the beginning. He's vulnerable for sure. Yeah. For sure. And remember we keep on thinking that that we're not competitive in Florida. We're extremely competitive in Florida from the time that that uh, George Bush and Al Gore were fighting. We can win Florida. We have won, won Florida since then. The reason we didn't win Florida this time is Cuban Americans and Dade County. Uh, went for Trump. Right, exactly. Does anybody have a comment or question? Yes. Yeah. Well, it looks so, like you covered so everything. Let's go on with what's happening today. So, okay. as you know, this is a big old storm. And for the most part, except for the debt limit, it's Democrats arguing with Democrats. The leader now of the House Progressive Caucus which has 80 members, is Pramila Jayapal, who's from uh, South King County, used to run uh, One America, very fine person, fine public uh, servant, but in my view, uh, insufficiently attended to Joe Biden's needs, given that Joe Biden is our president, and given that around by two weeks or so ago, we have to have the nation recognize that Joe Biden's domestic agenda is intact and in the fact is doing well. So the issue, of course, is what's going to happen today in sense that will make, will have that be the narrative. Because as you know, it's an essential part of us winning a year from now. So uh, I should say, in case anybody ever comes onto this call and is looking for a nonpartisan description, we left that behind uh, six or eight months ago. And 
I'd be glad to return to it. We, when we started this program, I thought we were going to have uh, maybe even some Trump advocates on the call, but that hasn't taken place. Anyway, our narrative, as you know, is, uh, is not only that we're building back, but as much as I hate the slogan, but we're building back better. Our narrative is we're licking the COVID, that we're restoring the economy that was ravaged by COVID, that we have adults in the room in all, all times where there's meetings who know how the government works, and that we're restoring our reputation uh, abroad. And all that is music to the ears of uh, independent voters who gave us our margin over Trump. The short-term narrative is that Joe Biden has Warren Democrats on his hand and that it hands and it's extreme disorder and that his uh, agenda is at risk. The thing to remember about this is the following people know that they can't go home in October or November with this result. Charles Schumer, Nancy Pelosi, Bernie Sanders, Joe Biden, Kamala Harris, Pramila Jayapal, and Nancy Pelosi. Yes, it is true that, that they're having a war. And the reason they're having a war is when you only have 50 Senate votes for, uh, you're, you can't lose anybody, it gives that person a lot of leverage, Joe Manchin and, and to some extent, Kristen Sinema. So if you're over in the House, what, Charles Schumer is saying to Nancy Pelosi is, don't make me do any more than that for what you want to pass in the House because I can't pass it in the Senate because I don't have 50 votes. And if you're a progressive in the House, you that hurt your feelings because you got you did an oath of office too. So what the progressives think they can do is leverage uh, Manchin because Manchin wants Biden to be successful. So that's why Manchin has said, well, I'll vote for a 1.5 trillion reconciliation bill on healthcare and childcare and community college, even a little bit of climate change. I'll vote for $1.5 trillion today. And why those house members are saying, excuse me, you left out $2 trillion. The, the, the problem is the only leverage they have in the House with regard to the infrastructure bill and reconciliation and all these things is um, how much Joe Mike Manchin wants to pass the bipartisan infrastructure bill. They hope that they can get some more leverage from him because he likes Joe Biden and because he wants that bill. Uh, that's their hope. I would say on points that that Manchin has more leverage than they do. But we'll find out today because Pelosi has now said that there's going to be a vote on the infrastructure bill today. The way that looks is you would you could get some Republicans to vote for that. You could release some of the progressive Democrats and you could pass it uh, a little, by a little bit, but Biden needs Manchin to say something that he can use with uh, House Democrats so that they'll feel like they got something out of this fight. What that is, I don't know. Maybe it's a little more than 1.5 billion trillion. Maybe it's some element, but for Nancy Pelosi to get those votes and Biden to get those votes, they have to get something from Manchin that will allow some of those uh, progressives to vote for the infrastructure bill. And then uh, that has to do, let's remember we have four things. We have a continuing resolution on whether to continue to operate the government. That'll pass today, it just passed yesterday. We have an infrastructure bill already passed in the Senate, it's a trillion dollars, it's a great bill. and. Um, and it had 17 Republican uh, votes, which is wonderful, which Manchin likes and you should like. Then we have a $3.5 trillion reconciliation bill, 
where Manchin wants 1.5 trillion and the liberals, progressives want 3.5 trillion. And then we have to increase the debt limit in the next two months. I'll go back to that and just say that in terms of the what Manchin could give on that 3.5 billion that Jayapal Paul and other Democrats want, our Congressman, uh, Derek Kilmer is more of a centrist than that. I'm sure he wants them to have some success, but he's, he, is, he doesn't share uh, uh, Jayapal's politics. You know, he, rep, he, he never did. I mean, Derek Kilmer's much more of a, of a centrist Democrat. At any rate, what's in the difference between 1.5 trillion and 3.5 trillion? We're talking about uh, six major things. We're talking about the same child tax credit that they already passed uh, in a previous bill, just renewing it. We're talking about um, cheaper prescription drugs, two years of community college for everyone, regardless of their income level. My not favorite. I would always need to test that. If somebody's family has a million dollars, I don't want to pay for the community college. Uh, Expanded child care for three and four year olds, get more people back to work. Here's a favorite for some of us, dental, hearing and vision protection for Medicare. But I've had a good time on Medicare and I would have even a better time if, uh, if, uh, if I paid for my, some of my dental. On the other hand, I do am aware that uh, we don't have a, as much money as we'd like to. Two weeks of paid family and medical leave for people who are employed, and then some stuff on climate change where they would incentivize uh, companies to do more clean energy. So that's the difference. That's what the progressives want, that Joe Manchin thinks is uh, too much and somewhat inflationary, and that's what will get resolved today, that is, or soon some kind of reassurances from the Senate on what they will pass that will permit those House progressives to give Nancy Pelosi enough votes to pass the infrastructure bill. Then they'll turn right around in the next two months, two weeks, and execute whatever deal they cut on reconciliation. And then, believe it or not, Mitch will yield and let them uh, and not object to them passing the debt ceiling with 51 Democrats. And the reason he will do that is otherwise all the millionaires of public support will call him and say they don't want a 10% drop in the stock market, which will cost them a whole lot of money. And so that's what will happen in the next two weeks in that sequence. First, the continuing resolution that's been passed, then the infrastructure bill, then the new deal on what the reconciliation bill that we only need 50 votes on will include with the six things I just talked about, what extent any of them will be included or paired back, and then uh, the debt ceiling. And so that will be what will happen in the new, next two weeks. The reason it will happen is they don't want to go into next year's election with Joe Biden's domestic agenda being in tatters. They are fully aware that that would be a big wound to uh, their colleagues running for office next year. So they know they have to resolve it. This is just showed out me. Now I'm gonna give you a test on all that. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila. You know, David, tell me why they haven't, uh, Joe Biden hasn't set uh, Pete Buttigieg out on the hustings about the infrastructure? Um, well, there is something going on there, and that is uh, we, Joe Biden, with help with Pete Buttigieg's help, wants that bill a lot. So you could go from city to city and say, don't you know that that includes keeping that bridge over the river from falling into the river? Don't you understand these things? And when Pete is interviewed, that's what he says. However, there's a political reason why you wouldn't 
be out there doing that right now. You're hammering your side. You're saying implicitly, you're, because of people blocking it right now, there's not getting a lot of Republican votes, but 17 in the Senate, but the people who are explicitly blocking it are House progressives and Joe Biden and Pete Buttigieg do not want to go city by city and, and, uh, and punch out their own party. That's why it's more in meeting rooms in D.C. Could get to that, but uh, I heard just the other day uh, somebody from organized labor in Washington State saying, we need that infra infrastructure money and Kumela Jayapal's wrong, but you don't hear very much of that because they're trying to have it be an in-house squabble. Other... Yeah. Oh, I was just mentioning, it's like, you know, the three point, what was it, 3.6 they were asking for originally. Do you think that was padded so that they know that they were going to have to negotiate down? Yes. And as you may remember, when we did the first reconciliation bill, which uh, is called the American Rescue Plan, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and um, there, they, we started out with a higher number. And then uh, in the infrastructure bill, we ended up with 1.2 trillion, and that was well over 2 trillion at one time, and it included some of the, these things that they're now calling uh, human infrastructure. It included some of the Medicare changes and the community college stuff. And now we're calling those human infrastructure. I said on my blog, it's so funny, back when I used to work in DC, the last word as uh, I worked as uh, the director of the, uh, I worked for the governor of Michigan uh, in, in DC, and the last word that I would have ever said to a senator or congressman was infrastructure. It was an extremely boring and unpopular word, and now it's got so much juice behind it that anything you do in Congress has to have infrastructure at the end of it. So this 3.5 trillion is human infrastructure, which is technically meaning underlying capacity to deliver services. So I guess you could call it that. Um, now I got away from the <laughs> question was, well, Was that padded? Oh, padded, yes, absolutely. All numbers that are started by Biden have a higher number than he expects to get. Okay. Now, if people are unhappy with that, they can go elect us five more senators and then Manchin can't veto the reconciliation bill. Yes. Well, we all I know is that this, this bill is extremely popular in the pools for, for citizens. They want to well, see this pass. You know, we haven't talked about the, the revenue side, but they would yes. uh, increase uh, taxes by two trillion. They would increase uh, uh, the corporate tax rate and they would increase capital gains and regular income taxes for people, very wealthy Americans. Yeah. So um, that's, of course, one of the reasons for the Republican opposition. Uh, Manchin also doesn't like He's a coal guy, but it's yeah. too bad. Uh, we need another few senators just because he's, you know, we're in a long-term crisis with regard to climate change, and it doesn't help to have uh, a coal guy telling us we can't spend money to incentivize power plants to do clean energy. Right, yeah. Yep, he has a he has a tight uh, he had a la tight race last time in West Virginia, so yeah, I know well he's playing both sides. So yeah, he well he and that is who he is. I mean, yeah. it's, Joe Manchin is not a flaming liberal that is pretending to be a moderate. He's moderate pretending to be a moderate, right. and and uh, so yeah, Trump won by thirty points in West Virginia. So you're not you're it is true that. What he's doing is to his political benefit, but it is also who he is. Yeah. Um, Anybody else? On what is happening now? So my prediction is the two weeks uh, you in two weeks you will see this as resolution, 
remember that they can pass a reconciliation bill each year. So if they don't get something they want, there's a lot of pent up demand because we didn't have either the Senate or the presidency uh, for those four years. So there's a lot of things that Democrats want to do. So you can't blame them for wanting to do them all right now. It's just example, community college. I, I used to chair the state uh, workforce training and education coordinating board, which was a major proponent of community college education as a path to advance skills and a strong economy. And I don't understand why we would use money that we do not have to pay tuition to a kid whose parents, you know, have a million dollars in Apple stock. I just don't get that at all. Um, so I think there are th things that should be universally available like education for seven year olds, but I wouldn't add uh, community college to that list for people who have ability to pay. Yeah, Thomas Kilbane. David, thank you. How uh, real are the poll numbers on Biden and how damaging, um, obvious, to me, obviously those have to turn around to, before the next election uh, or we're in big trouble. Uh, so what do you, how do you see that changing? Yeah, I think uh, they're still higher than, than Trump's at his highest, they're below 50. Um, he's not on the ballot next time, but as you say, it still has to turn around because we got five or six uh, closed Senate races and we, we want uh, affiliation with Biden to be a, a strength and not a weakness. So you look at Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Iowa is changing because Grassley's running again, uh, North Carolina, Missouri. Uh, especially Pennsylvania and Ohio, which would be two juicy pickups, you want Biden to be strong among independent voters. And of course, that goes back to build back better because as you know, being an Ohio guy, what he's trying to do is rebuild the manufacturing base among other things and respond to blue collar workers, uh, some of which who left the reservation. So I think those numbers have to go up. Just remember that the other number that is key is the generic congressional vote. So um, we didn't do quite as well in, uh, in the election in November. On, we lost some seats we didn't expect to lose if you look at what people say, which party they're gonna vote for. And I think that's because uh, uh, defund the police was the world's worst political slogan in, in the last, in the domestically, at least in the last 20 years, reform the police. We would have six more congressmen uh, because it's so essential and, and supported by 70% of the public. To them, defund means don't have any, which is not a popular view. There's a reason why people wanted to use that language. They wanted to provoke us. I'm just saying, uh, uh, it was unwise. At any rate, right now the generic vote is where I had 2%. At some point in the last election, we were at 6%. That isn't enough of a margin. People say, which party would you vote for? And we have a 2% lead. A lot ha will happen in terms of um, if the COVID um, is reduced, say if by February, so we don't, the Delta variant, the vaccines are up with the mandates. Um, the Delta variant is sliding a little bit, uh, new cases. If on February or March, there's no variant to follow, there's a new treatment that Merck's got out this night and today, which is very exciting. If around March, the nation is breathing a little bit easier, Biden's going to get the credit, and he uh, knows that, and his polls will go back up to the low 50s, and it'll be easier to, for Senate candidates to run it by his side, uh, especially in those states I described. 
remember there is a wild card, and that is Mitch McConnell is running a different slate of candidates in most of these states than Joe Biden. Mitch McConnell and some of those others are even supporting Liz Cheney in Wyoming. Uh, so uh, in some states, they're going to come to an agreement, uh, probably with Herschel Walker running against Warnock in Georgia. But the fact that the Republicans are fighting Republicans gives us a great possibility that some of those races, House and Senate, the more conservative candidate will win and give us a better chance to win the independence and win the general election. So yet again, Trump would be our campaign manager if that happens. Sheila. My um, contacts in Wisconsin uh, are telling me that it might be very interesting out there. Um, it's not as tight, um, with, with Johnson going away, uh, it looks like, despite the fact of all the huge conservative conservative people out there, it looks like it might be a little tighter race um, on the Senate side. Well, we, as you know, we won the governorship there, so it's, and the Supreme Court, Wisconsin Supreme Court, so it shows that we can win statewide in Wisconsin. And for years, we had Prox Meyer and Gaylord Nelson, so in those days, obviously, we could win. We had both Senate seats for a long time. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's 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 competitive uh, for sure. It's I don't I haven't followed who uh, is emerging as the the candidate. Um, uh, North Carolina is another one where Richard Burr is retiring and uh, where we're competitive. So uh, we also need to not lose seats, and that's why we want to want Raphael Warnock, Reverend Warnock, to to mm -hmm. win in Georgia. Absolutely. Christina, do you have a question? Um, yes, I think that the poll numbers, I think uh, you're right on target with, um, if we don't have another variant coming up, that's going to uh, greatly help Biden. But I also seem to think that if, given that we know that the infrastructure is going to pass one way or the other, because it would be just detrimental to change his entire, Biden's entire agenda. Um, I think that maybe his poll numbers will start coming back up if, once we get that passed as well. So I think that's also in his favor. Um, I'm hope, I don't know that you feel the same on that. And then the other thing that I was wanting to know is what is Grassley doing? Do they not have anyone to run in that seat? Do you know anything, David? The guy is ancient. He's yeah. as old as dirt. Charles Grassley is older than any of us on this call. He's 88, I think. Um, Charles Grassley, I had a lot of hope for Charles Grassley. And in the olden days, I, the governor of Michigan I worked for was Bill Milliken, who was an associate of Dan Evans and Nelson Rockefeller from the old, no longer existent wing of the Republican Party. And uh, Grassley made some head fakes in that direction. And he was really furious at Trump over inspectors general. Remember, uh, each cabinet agency has a key ethics and audit official that Trump massacred and that was Grassley's baby. So he likely would like to stay around and restore inspectors general, but mainly it's just, you live your whole life in the Senate and he's been there a long time and you're still living and somebody picks you up in the car, takes you to the office, you work, you vote, you go home. That's a nice life if, you know, it's, you're doing important things. It's hard to walk away from. Um, some people don't like it at all. When Dan Evans was out there, he didn't have any hard time coming back home. But for the most part, if you've ever been a senator, you'd like to continue to be a, a senator. It's just, uh, it's hard to walk away from. I agree with Christina that a number of things that can increase Biden at the polls, uh, the decline in COVID, uh, the rest, the a strength in the economy, uh, wars among Republicans, uh, uh, the passage of his domestic agenda, even with Republicans saying that it's spending too much money, the elements of that agenda are 
going to be popular and that will be uh, uh, something that will be 60, 40 approved of. So you can see Biden go up into the low 50s. Uh, remember, some of those polls that are, you got to look at all the lines of the poll because if Biden's at 52, it doesn't mean he's 52, 48. It'd be something like 52, 38, and 10. Don't know. It's it's not as bad as it sounds, but it's it's definitely down from when he was elected. Yeah. Afghanistan is funny, weird because. Uh, there was always going to be some turmoil leaving, but I think he left himself more susceptible than he needed to, even when he was going to leave. I think they, I may have said this to you before, but the reason why they didn't uh, take the troops out and the, our friends out in advance is that they were told by the Afghan government that then the, the government would automatically fall. We were maintaining what turned out to be a fiction that the Afghan military would protect the country and we didn't want them losing to be a preordained conclusion. So we left people there and waited to watch them hold on to the country, which they didn't do at all. So that's it's not like Biden didn't know that he could have withdrawn people earlier. He just didn't want to create a self-fulfilling prophecy. Other things on our present predicament before I close with a comment on Virginia. Tom, your mic is off. Do you want to say something, Tom? No, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. Just want to make sure we cover everybody. So, okay, David, we can go ahead. Okay, so we've got a few more minutes. There's an election in Virginia in the first two in the first Tuesday of November. Um, you may remember after Trump got elected, our first fight back was a year after he got elected. We made huge inroads in Virginia, and I think that's when Ralph Northam, yeah. So that would have been when Ralph Northam was elected governor. Um, so we engineered that. And the other state that is on this odd schedule is New Jersey, which is a clear Democratic state. And Phil Murphy, who's the Democratic governor, is under no challenge. In uh, Virginia, the Democratic candidate is Terry McAuliffe, who was governor before and is an old friend of Bill Clinton was once chair of the Democratic National Committee and has been around too long to be a stellar candidate. I mean, when you're around long enough, Greg Nichols once said that to me as mayor of Seattle. If you're mayor for eight years, somebody's going to be mad at you for something you did. And that's true of Terry McAuliffe. Right now, Terry McAuliffe has a 4% lead over his Republican opponent, whose name just slipped away, who's a former hedge fund manager. What the campaign they're running is very, uh, is trading quite a bit on how Gavin Newsom survived the recall. And that is, um, it helps with independent voters a lot to paint your opponent as Trumpian. And um, this guy, the opponent, doesn't mention Trump, but he got recorded saying to somebody that he was going to be uh, fighting against abortion rights, choice rights, aggressively, even though he couldn't mention that in the campaign. And McAuliffe has used that against him. So uh, hold on tight. If you were in the giving mood, you'd go on to swingleft.org's website, and they have a package proposal seven legislators who are up so that we can keep the House and some money for McAuliffe. We have uh, 55, 45 in the House. We're ahead 21 and 18 with one independent in the Senate. And the prediction is we're going to squeak through on all three. 
much more likely to squeak through, we come full circle, if the Democrats resolve all their DC matters in the next couple of weeks. That would free Biden to uh, help McAuliffe. And as you know, all that voting power right now is in the Virginia suburbs, which are very, very focused on what's happening in the federal government. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's what's happening in Virginia. Um, I've been looking for a grassroots organization. I hate giving money to candidates themselves because they already have a bazillion dollars. But I don't have a grassroots work organization to, to, uh, to recommend. For those of you who are really into this, you could, you could see what uh, Indivisible or someone else is saying about that, about where to give money outside of the candidates. But all I have to offer on that account is uh, swing left. Okay. Very good. Thoughts on that? I, well, I, I do have another question. What's happening with Stacey Abrams? Um, I think she's uh, running. Is she not? I mean, the issue is whether she's running for governor. That's not now. It's next year. Uh, uh, Trump continues to take huge swipes at Brian Kemp, who's the sitting governor who did not agreed to illegally overturn the election, so that's quite a sin. Uh, it's still possible, as you may know, that uh, that the attorney general will charge Trump with, with violating, with committing election fraud by calling the secretary of state and asking him to find 11,000 votes for him. But at any rate, I think Stacey Abrams is running. Um, I haven't checked that lately. If so, she's formidable. Um, I wouldn't say that that she can't win. Uh, I I'd say it, you know it depends on turnout. Remember, she only lost a very little uh, last time when when Kemp won, and they've registered hundreds of thousands of additional people since then. Uh, Georgia's changing. I would I would say that would be very interesting. The other interesting one is. Is Beto O'Rourke's thinking of running against Greg Abbott, who's also in trouble with Trump. Uh, there, there's going to be a Republican primary and everybody's chewing on Greg Abbott. And that's why he's been such a jerk with regard to border issues is because he's trying to feed red meat to Trumpites. So uh, that could leave room in the middle. I don't know how Beto is at occupying the middle, but He's seriously considering uh, running. So this is all not this November, of course, but a year from November. Mm -hmm. I just read uh, here in the Atlanta Journal, it says the jolt, Stacey Abrams' exciting tour stokes more buzz about 2022 plans. So, uh -huh. yeah, so I think that the, she is, I think it's a, a groundswell for running for governor, so. She was on Bainbridge before the pandemic and I missed it. Uh, uh, I was out of town, but, uh, you know, she's, she's, Tracy Abrams is not just a politician. She's uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, but accomplished business person and political veteran and all around impressive person without whom we would have 48 votes in the Senate and not 50 and would not be talking about 1.5 trillion versus 3 trillion. We would be talking about zero trillion mm -hmm. if it weren't for her. Yeah, she's amazing. So, any final thoughts, questions, insights? Yeah. So, <laughs> what's going to happen if we get on November, Reed and and uh, Karen? And I'm all wrong on this. You guys are going to boot me off the show. Hey, we've got video evidence. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> I let's, let's go to the videotape. Is one of the <laughs> and I'll just say it was my evil twin, Skippy. <laughs> Listen, you've got, you've got tenure now. Yeah, that's, right. that's right. I've been out with you guys. You'll just say David had an off day. <laughs>